Hi, I'm Mike Fisk, pastor here at Zion. I'd like to thank you for listening in today. I'm glad you're here. Sometimes life can be busy and the most important things can fall between the cracks. Simple things like saying thank you, for example. Oftentimes it's those little things that can make a difference in relationships. They start out strong and vibrant and alive, and then little things sneak in to weaken or destroy them. It happens with friendships, workplace relationships, marriages, even your relationship with God. My prayer is that you will be encouraged during your time here by this message and grow in your relationship with God through Jesus Christ, a relationship that offers hope, forgiveness, and healing. Thanks again for listening in. And if you're ever in the area, we invite you to stop in for a visit. I had a do-over once. I was out golfing with a friend of mine, and he uh, said, well, now on this hole, do not hit the tree. You've got to be careful not to hit the tree. And I swung and I hit, and you know what happens when you focus on not hitting something? I hit the tree. But he gave me a do-over at least. Anyway, as we continue on with our worship this morning, I invite you to stand and turn with me to the book of Numbers. We'll be reading chapter 32, verses 44 through 52. Numbers 32, 44 through 52. Um, If you want to follow along, you can follow along in the Pew Bible. Um, Otherwise, um, you can just follow along in your personal Bible or just listen as uh, I read this passage for us this morning. Moses came to Joshua, son of Nun, and spoke all the words of this song in the hearing of the people. When Moses finished reciting all these words to all Israel, he said to them, Take heart. All the words I have solemnly declared to you this day, so that you may command your children to obey carefully all the words of this law. They are not just idle words for you, they are your life. By them you will live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. On that same day the Lord told Moses, go up into the Abiram range to Mount Nebo in Moab, across from Jericho, and view Canaan, the land I am giving the Israelites as their own possession. There on the mountain that you have climbed, you will die and be gathered to your people, just as your brother Aaron died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people. This is because both of you broke faith with me in the presence of the Israelites at the waters of Meribah, Kadesh, in the desert of Zin, and because you did not uphold my holiness among the Israelites. Therefore, you will see the land only from a distance, and you will not enter the land that I am giving the people of Israel." Would you pray with me, please? Lord Jesus, we thank you again for the opportunity that we have to come together. Father, I just pray now that as we look into your word, that you would uh, inspire us, that you would enlighten us with what you have for us. I pray, as I always do, that the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth would be satisfying and glorifying to you and would also be, be pleasing to those of us as we go from this place and enable us to walk this path we call life in your name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. This morning we're going to be finishing up a series that we started actually the first part of September called Missing the Mark, or a a rather fresh start. And uh, this morning our topic is Missing the Mark, but not the Blessing. And so as we kind of wind things up, I want to spend just a very few moments just kind of recapping where we've gone in the last few weeks um, in this study. Because the whole thing of the fresh start was the idea of helping us to realize that there comes a time when we just need to stop, regroup, and continue on. We started out by talking about the fact that Jesus told his disciples to follow me. That idea of following Jesus wasn't just some flippant remark that he made. He didn't say, thou shalt be confirmed. He didn't say, you should be baptized. What he said is, follow me. And when he said, follow me, it wasn't like people do on Twitter. I have over 1,200 people following me on Twitter, most of whom I've never seen in life, some of which I hope or I'm somewhat questioning whether they're real people or not. It's not just that kind of follow. It's not just following like you do on Facebook, where you have all these quote-unquote friends that you might see once in a while. When Jesus said to the disciples, follow me, it was dramatic. It was a complete change. They left everything that they had 
to follow Jesus. It was a complete change in life. Jesus calls us to follow him. And as we continued our study, we looked at the, the life of Moses and we kind of followed him through his life. One of the things that we talked about is that God wants to do something new in our lives. Remember the penny? God wants to do something new. And he showed that with Moses. The Israelites were in a hopeless situation. They were living in slavery. There was no hope God had given them a promise hundreds of years earlier and it wasn't happening. And they'd gone from being people that were very popular because of, of um, Joseph to becoming people that were nothing but scapegoats and, and slaves. But a little baby was born in a basket or born and put in a basket. And that little baby grew to become one of Pharaoh's prized students. The poster child to the Israelites. And he would change the world, but it started very, very small. God wants to do something new in our lives. He wants to do that, and we reminded we were reminded of the importance of listening to what he has to say to that. We continued on studying the story of Moses, and we were reminded that God wants us to be extraordinary. And we looked at Moses, and when Moses saw the burning bush in the desert, and he gave God every excuse in the book for why he couldn't do what God wanted him to do. He didn't know God well enough. He wasn't gifted enough. He was the laughing stock of all the Israelites. All these things that Moses tried, or, uh, yeah, Moses tried to say that he couldn't do the job. And God said, no, I called you. I gave you the gifts. I gave you the ability. God wants us to be extraordinary. And he's given us everything we need to be extraordinary, but we need to do the opposite of what Moses did. Because when God said, this is what I want you to do, remember what Moses said? Send somebody else. I agree with everything you say, but send somebody else. What God is looking for in our lives, what God is looking for in our activities and in our heart, is for people to be more like Isaiah, who saw God rather than himself. When he saw God, he said, here am I, send me. Send me into the community to make a difference. Send me home to my family to make a difference. You've given me everything I want, uh, that I need to do it. Help me to be extraordinary, because God wants us to be extraordinary. We went on to talk about the fact that Moses learned a hard lesson about life. He learned that we need each other. Moses was in charge of everything uh, that the Israelites needed to do. He was the go-to guy. And his father-in-law came to him and said, you need to change this. You need to get some help. You need to spread out your, your, uh, your authority to other people. You see, Moses was kind of like some of us. He, he's either, you're either a rock or you're an island. Either you're a rock in the sense that you've been hurt so many times that you refuse to let other people in. Or you're an island and you've just decided that you can get along without other people. But as we learned in that lesson, we all need Jethro's. We all need people that will come along beside us to say, here's what you need to do to help. We all need the people of Israel who when Moses came to them and said, I need your help to do this better, they came and they were there for him. We need leaders, and I think we're all leaders in a sense, who are willing to hand off responsibility and work with other people to accomplish the kingdom. We need each other. And then last week, we talked about gossip. And we talked about the fact that our attitudes determine our progress. Remember the story? Aaron and Miriam, Moses' brother and sister, were talking against him, criticizing him for the way he was doing things. And what it says is, and God heard their words. Moses didn't do anything about what was happening, but God heard them. When we were reminded of the fact that when we speak evil of other people, we're not speaking evil of other people, we're speaking evil of God's creation. You're made in God's image. God made you His masterpiece. And so if I speak evil against you, I'm not speaking evil against you, I'm speaking evil against the author, the sculptor that made you just the way you are. 
And what happened with them happens with the church over and over and over again is because of the grapevine, because of people talking behind other people's back, the entire community of Israel was halted. And they couldn't progress because of the words that Miriam and Aaron spoke. Attitude determines progress. This morning, we come to the story of Moses and talk about missing the mark, not the blessing. Moses had a very, a tremendously close relationship with God, a kind of relationship very, very few people have. You see, like God said to Moses and Miriam and Aaron last week, there's some people that God speaks through so we can hear them. Sometimes we hear God, hopefully you hear God every once in a while, speaking through my words. And you realize, okay, God is say, Mike is saying the words, but God is, is, is revealing something I need to listen to. Sometimes you might do it by spending time in the Bible or reading a good Christian book or listening to a radio station. God speaks to you that way, but not Moses. The Israelites asked Moses to put a paper bag over his head. Okay, it wasn't a paper bag, but you understand the idea. Because when he did gun talking to God, Face to face, his face glowed so brightly that they couldn't look at him. They said, put a veil over your head because you're too bright for us to look at. Moses talked to God face to face. Few of us have even heard God whisper. Many of us, and I said us, many of us have never been close enough that the Holy Spirit has even had opening to speak through us. And so Moses had that relationship with God where God would come down and talk with him. And one day God said to him, Moses, guess what? What, God? You're going to die. Say what? You're going to die. Your time's up. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go up to the mountain over there and I want you to look out over the land of Canaan. Because Moses, 40 years ago, you started a process for me. You took my people out of Egypt and you brought them across the wilderness, and guess what? It's time for them to get the promise that I gave them. And so I want you to look, I want you to look out over the land, because that's what I'm giving them, and you're not going in. Say what? Forty years of working for you? Forty years of putting up with this stubborn, rebellion, Scandinavian, uh, Israelites, I know, I just couldn't resist that. Uh, mostly because I am one. You want me to put up with all these people for 40 years, and now I've done everything you asked, and now I'm standing at the brink, and you're not letting me go in. And God said, no, because you did not give me the glory that was my due. Because you made me look bad in front of the, the Israelites. So let me explain what happened. And I won't take time to be able to go to these passages. I'll tell you what they are, and you can take a look at home if you want. In Exodus chapter 17, an interesting thing happens. Shortly after the Israelites leave Egypt, they're going through the desert of Zin, and there's no water. And so they start to complain. Why did you bring us out here to die? Why couldn't we have stayed in Egypt? We had good food. We had job security. We had real houses, not tents. We had water. We had all that stuff. And you're bringing us out here and we don't have water. We're just going to die. Our kids are going to die. Our cattle's going to die. Thanks a lot, Moses. Can you imagine what it was like for a leader at that point? Kids, listen up. When you hear parents talk about the good old days, something you need to realize about the good old days they're only telling you the good part. That's why they call them good old days. For example, my favorite age was 17, which was <clears throat> years ago. Why I like 17 was this. I had a pretty nice car. I had a good job for them. I had a girlfriend. <clears throat> Couldn't get much worse. Right? Better, better than that, rather. So I go to my job, I get my paycheck, I go to the bank, I put everything in my bank, the bank except for $20. Then I take that $20 out, I fill my car with gas, I take my girlfriend out bowling, we go out for a burger afterwards, I'd buy, 
And then the rest of that $20 I just spend, use for spending money the rest of the week. <laughs> you can't even put five gallons in a car nowadays. Well, I guess you can now. Those are the good things. And my insurance was paid for. I didn't have electric bills. I didn't have uh, gas bills except for my car. It was great. Those were the good old days. I hated high school. That's the other side of the coin that we don't talk about in the good days. We don't talk about the fact that I hated taking tests. I couldn't read very well. I only had one friend, and she was my girlfriend. And it was not a fun time for me. That's what the Israelites were doing. They said to Moses, we don't have water. We had all that good food. We had all that, that stuff back in Egypt, and you took all that away from us. These were the same people, if you read earlier in Exodus, that were calling out to God in misery, saying, please deliver us from this place that they're now asking you to go back to. Because they'd forgotten what God did. Don't we do that? Don't we forget all the good things that God has done for us when times get bad. That's why we have a lot of people, we were talking about this in Sunday school this morning, that's why you have a lot of people that walk away from God. And they walk away from church because all the things that they were expecting didn't happen. And they forgot to look back to see what God had done in the past. Fast forward, Numbers chapter 20. The Israelites are going through the desert. They don't have any water. They start to complain. Oh, wait, I've got to back up. I almost blew the story. So Moses says to God, what am I going to do? These people are going to kill me. And God says, go out and strike that rock and it'll get water. So Moses goes out and he says, and this is my paraphrase, Moses goes out and says, the, the Lord our God is with us. And he strikes the rock and water comes forth. Now we fast forward. Numbers chapter 20. Same situation. The Israelites are complaining that God had not provided them with anything. God goes to Moses and says, what am I going to do? Moses says, go out to that rock and speak to that rock and water will come forth. So this time Moses goes out, he takes his staff and he says, you stubborn, rebellious, ornery people. Do we have to give you water? And he struck the rock and water came forth. It's not what God told him to do, is it? God said, speak to the rock. The first time Moses said, here's what God is going to do for you, and he struck the rock. He obeyed God. The second time he said, here's what I'm going to do for you, and he struck the rock. God gave water both times, but what he said to Moses is this. He said, because you defamed my name, because you went against what I told you, you will not see the promised land. Isn't that interesting? When Moses was guilty of murder, God forgave him. And life went on. Even though his sin was against men. When God was guilty of sinning against, or when Moses was guilty of sinning against himself, I can't do it. God forgave him. And life went on. But when Moses sinned against God, God forgave him, but there were consequences. That's why Moses stood on that mountain looking out over the land that God promised. Scholars aren't sure why that happened, to be honest with you. Some people think it's because the rock is a vision of Jesus Christ, or a symbol of Jesus Christ. And to strike it the first time was a symbol of his, his crucifixion. But the second time, there is no other sacrifice, no other crucifixion that shouldn't have been hit. Some think it's because Moses took credit for it the second time. The first time, God showed his power. That's why Moses was supposed to hit the rock. The second time, Moses was, trying to, was supposed to show the people God's mercy and grace. Instead, he showed God's power again. You see, we get hung up on that. He missed the mark. He didn't do what he was expected to do. But the good news is that he still maintained the blessing. You see, it's interesting that just that one defining moment in Moses' life determined his destiny on earth. But it didn't change 
his eternal blessing. Hebrews chapter 11. It's an interesting verse. It says all these people in Hebrews chapter 11 is the uh, faith chapter of the Bible. It says all these people, and it gives a whole list of all the people that live by faith. When they died, they did not receive the image promise. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting they were for foreigners and as strangers on earth. All the people in the Old Testament that believed in God, all the people in the New Testament that believed Jesus would come back, had a promise. But that promise didn't come. But you see, that's what faith is about. Faith is about realizing that even when God doesn't do things in our time in the way we want Him to, He's still there and we still believe in Him and we still trust in Him. And that's hard to do, isn't it? It's easy to do it when time is good. But it's hard when the times are bad. So here's what I want to share with you this morning that hopefully will help you to be able to realize that during those times of of the hard stuff, to remain people that even though the promise isn't there, we stay true to God. And I call it investment living. I am not an investor. I can point you to people that are good investors and I can, you know, they can give you, you know, probably more details. But I want to just look at three things about what investment strategy tells you that is important as well for the Christian life. The first one is this. Good investors know that investment is for the long term. If you've ever dabbled in the stock market, you know that. People that are in the stock market that are successful are in it for a long, long time because they know the stock market has ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs. I didn't ask permission for this, so I could be in trouble later on this afternoon, but I'm going to tell you the story anyway. Melanie was in a class, and she had to do, as part of her classwork, had to, quote, unquote, buy some stock. And she came home, and she said, I bought, you know, such and such stock, she told us. The next day she came home, and she said, I sold my stock. Why? Because it went down. In a day? Yeah. But that's what we do. Maybe not with money, but we, we look at things and if things don't work out. And I said, you know what, though? Good stock market people know that you stay in it for the long haul. In spiritual life, it's the same way. Too many of us want to give up on this whole God thing because we fail. And we need to look at the long term. Rather than judging your spirituality and your ability to live for Jesus by how you did this moment, how did you do compared to yesterday? Where are you at now compared to next year, or last year rather? Are you growing in the Lord? Are you closer to Him now than you were? That's what investment is living is about. The Christian life is long term. It takes time. There's going to be ups and downs. But just like with the stock market, just like with investment, you stick with it. Not because you know you're wise, but because the person that you're following is. A good investor probably has a good person on the stock market telling them how to do it. The second thing is the stock market, uh, the uh, person that's in investments knows that it's good to be consistent. It's nice if you have a whole big chunk of money to put into investing. Few of us have that. But a wise investment counselor will tell you, you know what, the li- the, even if you can just put in a little bit, even if you just put in $10 a week, it's a start. A year from now, you're better off than you were last year. The Christian life is like that. Too many times we look and we say, man, I've got to get closer to God. So we start reading the Bible all the way through. (laughs) Big mistake. And so you start with Genesis and Genesis isn't so bad. You go to Exodus. Exodus isn't so bad. Leviticus, you start getting into the Mosaic Law and all kinds of names you can't pronounce. And you just keep going and you get bogged down and you think, I can't do this. Take little steps. We've got the daily bread back there. It's got a verse in it. On your way out the door, read the verse and meditate on it through the day. If you've got a smartphone, you can download a Bible app that will give you a verse a day. Start with the little things in growing your Christian life. That's what it means to be consistent. That's what helps us over the long period of time is as we build those little steps. The other thing is investment people will tell you 
is you need to remember to cut your losses. What that means in the business community is that there comes a point in your life where you realize this isn't working. And you may lose a bunch of money in it, but you just need to set that aside and move on. Same thing is true in the Christian life. Some of us have been dealing for way too long with sin and with failures and with decisions that we look back and we are so embarrassed and so guilty and so beat up by the mistakes that we've made in life. And you know what? It's time to cut your losses. It's time to decide, you know what? This isn't working. I'm putting it beside. I'm leaving my past where it is. I'm starting out new. I'm starting out fresh. From this day forward, I'm going to make tiny steps. But I've determined that I'm going to grow closer to God because as Moses found out, there's times I'll miss the mark. But the blessing is there. See, one of the problems is, too many times we dwell on our weaknesses. Well, we need to realize that God celebrates our faithfulness. We dwell on all the times we failed or all the times other people have failed us. And God celebrates the fact that he gave his life, his son, for us. This morning I want to encourage you to become an investor in the Christian life. Investment living helps you to realize that your actions do make a difference, even if they're small actions. Investment in the Christian life means that you have learned to stop dwelling on the past and looking to the future. Investment living helps you to become disciplined in the spiritual part of your life not focus so much on the physical. This morning as we come together to take communion, let me remind you of what happened that night. Jesus was the only one in that room that knew what was going to happen. He knew that he was going to be crucified brutally for my sin. He knew that Many of his friends, all of his friends, would abandon him and he would die alone. Not even his father was there. Even his father turned his back. But what he said to disciples that night as they were getting ready to partake in the Lord's Supper, he said, this bread that we're eating is a symbol of new life of newness. It's a symbol of cutting your losses, forgetting about what's happened before. We're starting out new. And this wine that you're drinking is a symbol of new life, of forgiveness. And so every time you take part in this celebration, when I was growing up, we always played real quiet, somber music for communion. It should be a celebration. We're not, cel- we're not up here to remember a dead man. We're up here to remember a live man. And so as we partake this morning, Jesus says, remember what I taught you. Remember what I showed you. Remember what I promised you. Remember I warned you that you'd have trouble. I warned you that you would see a lot of persecution. But I promise to walk through that with you. Remember. Remember me. Remember that I didn't come to condemn you. I came to forgive you. Remember how I showed you love. Remember, I told you I was coming. I will. Don't forget. So as the uh, the deacons come forward to help us with taking our Lord's Supper, I just want you to focus on those things, to focus on the fact of our faithfulness and not our weakness. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, as we come to this time of our service and we remember your love and we remember your sacrifice, help us, Lord God, to remember that because of you we have new life, Help us to remember that in you we can have a new start. We can cut our losses. We can forget about the past. We can trust you to know that you have given us everything that that we need to go on. 
Then I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room. And I pray that as we go forth from this place, you would help us to go forth with a newness built upon this time together of remembering what you have done for us. And I pray these things in your righteous and holy name. Amen. And now to him who is able to do new and amazing things in our life, to him who is able to do far above and beyond all that we could ask or imagine, to him be all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. And all God's people said, Amen.